So I'm James Waters. I lead the product team at Pivotal around Cloud Foundry. Um, it's been my pleasure to work on the project for about three and a half years now, so it's been fun. Um, and what I wanted to do was to uh, get some folks who are building internal Cloud Foundries on a stage and talk a little bit about the dynamics of, you know, it's one thing to be a service provider and building a public service that is consumed in a generic way, um, but it's very different when you're building for an internal business customer who has a, a different kind of leverage, a different set of demands, different timetables. And uh, two people that are building an internal Cloud Foundry, you heard a, a great keynote yesterday from Jonathan from Warner Music. So Dave is the SVP of engineering at Warner Music. Um, and then Catherine is an IT architect at Intel, which is also building an internal Cloud Foundry. And I thought we'd get together, have a little fireside chat for 20, 30 minutes, and learn what it's like to build an internal cloud and how to be successful doing it. Um, so Catherine, maybe you want to kick off Tell us a little bit about when you got this idea of maybe we should build a PaaS, where that came from, um, and maybe the problem you were trying to solve. Okay, sure. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm uh, an enterprise architect, and uh, we've been working with Cloud Foundry for about two years now. And uh, we have a big, uh, we call it our open cloud program, which is, um, you know, basically can we build a cloud out of open source components? Uh, and starting with infrastructure as a service. So we've done a lot of you know, open stack work with infrastructure as a service, and we were looking to extend the value of our infrastructure as a service with uh, platform as a service. So that was really the motivator. Um, we saw that it was taking roughly um, you know, over a month to deploy applications into production, and there was just a huge opportunity to uh, increase agility and get applications landed a lot uh, faster for our developers. Now you guys had this great quote, which was idea to production in a, in a day. That's right. So that was, that's our mantra. It still is our mantra. Uh, make it possible to land an application in less than a day. And so that includes uh, a technical piece of actually you know, physically landing the application, but there's also a whole governance piece in there as well, which is an interesting challenge. Yeah. So, Hi. Hi. So welcome Cheaton from GE. He's also building an internal Cloud Foundry and a whole, whole series of other platform services for GE. What a, what a great, I've never added live, live capacity update on, on a panel. Right. No downtime. <laughs> Bosch, on de on Bosch deploy panelist. Yeah. <laughs> no downtime at all. So that, that's a great intro, Catherine. So Dave, maybe you can talk a little bit about what it was like to join an organization that had decided to build a platform as a service. And, what were some of the conversations that you have internally? Like, how do you how do you how do you talk to a business user? What this is going to do for them? How do you, how do you start to express this internally? How do you how do you sell this? Well, I think what what was so compelling was the idea that we were going to start from scratch. So we weren't going to drag all of the legacy applications and everything else onto something that was going to be net new. Um, we instead chose to address the business with what are your problems, what would you like, what can we do for you, um, and start at that point and then figure out what data we needed to drag over from the legacy environment in order to fulfill, uh, fulfill those business requirements. So our focus has been much more on these are the awesome things that the new IT can offer you by leveraging Cloud Foundry, and uh, we can do that very rapidly, much faster than what a traditional IT org of, of any type could really do. And these are customized applications. We're able to meet a lot of business requirements that uh, normally uh, you would have to ask in advance, uh, vastly far in advance, well, how large of a system do you need? How many users do you anticipate? Um, how much data do you think you're going to generate? What are the, all of those things that, um, for a business user, they have no idea. What they, they don't know how much data they're going to generate. And generally, they can't give you an accurate estimate of how many users uh, are actually going to use it when you have a company that has you know, 50 locations around the world with offices that vary in size from five to hundreds. So a, a predefined architecture and scalability model yes. takes a lot of the burden off the business user from having to even think about that. That's right. Um, so they're not filling out an IT provisioning form of I want eight VMs and four JBoss, you know, and that's right, exactly, and, and one Cisco connection. Yes, absolutely. That, that's that's pretty compelling. So, so Cheetah, maybe you can introduce yourself briefly. Hi, my name is uh, Chetan Gargil. I work for GE, GE Software, the 
uh, center of excellence that was set up in San Ramon a couple of years ago. Uh, as a part of our charter, we are actually supporting all GE businesses to build new generations of their products. So that includes GE Aviation, GE Healthcare, uh, oil and gas, and so on. And uh, we are actually looking at new business models uh, to deliver to the customers. So that's why the cloud has become very relevant to us. Got it, got it. And you have a, a, really, a really big challenge in terms of, you built for how many GE internal business units? I mean, the charts that you guys put up are just mind-blowing, the, the, the challenge of building something to satisfy all those requirements. Yeah. So uh, some of the things that we struggle with are uh, GE has pretty much every version of every product out there uh, in its uh, IT. And uh, some of the things that we need to do are to uh, hit the ground running in the sense that we have to uh, not just support the new generations of the applications, but also look at uh, what's already there and do it in a, in a seamless fashion. So existing applications should continue to run. And the newer ones should be built on the newer architecture, but interoperate with the older uh, applications. And as new teams are getting formed to build these applications, especially efforts like the Center of Excellence, where we are consolidating a lot of the development work in a single organization. So agility and simplicity has become very important. So as James was saying, predefined models, right? Uh, there, are, there is no reason why every application needs to have a different architecture and a different deployment model. Uh, we can actually simplify by uh, standardizing some of the application patterns that we already know exist and have them integrate with network patterns and deployment patterns that uh, uh, are required across different businesses. So in the case of GE, uh, actually we have to look at from a regulatory aspect also. Like in certain businesses, PCI compliance is important. In certain cases, uh, HIPAA compliance is important. So in, we are we actually building it in such a way that these, we are creating these cookie cutter approaches, and Cloud Foundry is perfect for that for us. That's fantastic. So you know, one thing that Catherine did that I think is really interesting, and uh, Angel mentioned it, and Chris had talked about it before, is you you hold internal hackathons. So Cornelia, is, you, is Cornelia here? Cornelia is awesome, and um, she's going to be at a hackathon with Catherine up in the city on Cloud Foundry today, but you even did this internally, and this is what IBM talked about, like when you're trying to get internal customers to use a new platform, you, you held a hackathon and invited people to come in. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're using infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. There's a need for applications to be written to be cloud aware. Right, to really take full advantage of the cloud. And so we found that we had a skills gap within Intel and we wanted to teach our developers how to create applications that run well in the cloud. Of course, I had an ulterior evil motive that I wanted to introduce them to platform as a service. So we are holding a series of one day hackathons where we bring developers in. We let them work on any application that they want, um, which is very immersive for them and uh, they have to actually host it on platform as a service in our enterprise private cloud. It's been uh, highly successful, it energ energizes the developers, and my evil plan is working because it's generating a lot of demand for the platform as a service. Yeah, I mean, we, we hear about this as a, a very common adoption model of getting platform as a service going internally. Uh, James Bear over here has been working with a, a large bank, and we, we heard from them the other day, like, our cluster is full. Like, essentially, they had opened it up to folks, and they suddenly needed more capacity. And I think that's a very innovative way of trying to communicate value to business, or line of business people, because you say, hey, your developers are already here using this service. It's already going. Um, now, one question, then, is how constrained do you think the model should be? So, Dave... Jonathan was here yesterday said, no relational databases on our platform as a service. How, how do you guys think about constraining your data model and the, the trade-offs of maybe the friendliness of, of a familiar model versus a, a new, more scalable model? Well, I think it's more of deciding uh, what your actual business needs are. We, we shied away from going with a traditional relational database uh, out from the start because we had other we had other needs that we were trying to meet. The, the idea of trying to replicate uh, a database around the world effectively, uh, we already had with, uh, with a very, very expensive Oracle solution. Um, and we decided we didn't want to do that again. Uh, and so we stepped back and looked and said, does our platform need that today? And it didn't. It doesn't. Uh, we have not found a need uh, so far. Uh, for strict uh, transactionality, 
doesn't mean we won't in the future. Um, we have a couple of things coming up that may, uh, that may push a demand and, and we will end up doing it at that point. Something we've learned is not to introduce a, a bunch of features and capabilities just to have them. There needs to be some ultimate business driving need that makes you want to turn on a service or use a service. It's not just because it's neat or cool. There needs to be a, a purpose and that includes, uh, uh, at least from a technical view, um, we haven't been doing caching in our architecture at all, uh, anywhere. And I've had engineers go, well, why aren't you guys caching all of this? It's because we haven't needed to, so we've chosen to not introduce that extra complexity without purpose. Makes a lot of sense. So I think that's pretty radical. Um, can, can I ask a clarifying question about that? So there's, there's a database in there to store, like, you know, I, I assume you have a big catalog of all of the recorded music, and so there is a database there. It's just that you're advocating, don't, nobody has direct access to it it's through service layer, right? Is that, or is there really no database there? There's, there's, a, there's more of a NoSQL, so think of a non-acid. Oh, okay. uh, so we actually use Cassandra as our primary storage. Okay. Um, and we don't store currently the music catalog in the net new system, um, mainly because we don't need to yet. That's a system that we've had around for a very long time. I think it has, uh, it's over a petabyte. I mean, it's very large. Uh, this right. is uh, non-compressed music, so you can imagine it gets pretty big. Uh, that's not part of the system yet. Uh, we haven't had a need from the business to make that part of the platform. Uh, we'll probably look at that, but my guess is we won't look at that for a couple of years. So, so Cheetah, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how you went through selecting a back-end model for, I, I know that you guys aren't completely done and it's not complete, but maybe think about how do you, how do you think of your back-end data structure model for a platform? Yeah, so uh, we are actually looking at different classes of applications, and in certain classes of applications, the data is highly distributed. Like in the case of uh, aviation, uh, one of the first problems that we had to solve was uh, optimizing the performance of jet engines and predicting failures. So the reason why that is important is that uh, whenever there is a failure of a jet engine, we get penalized by the airline or the uh, airplane manufacturer. And if you are able to predict that uh, problem beforehand, then we save a lot of money on that. So the problem there is that each of these jet engines today, they produce a lot of data. Uh, there are about 150 to 200 sensors on an average on an average jet engine. And every flight generates about between half a terabyte to one terabyte of data. And there is a GE jet airplane, uh, a jet engine actually taking, uh, taking off every two seconds. Uh, in the world somewhere. So the data is highly distributed. There is no way we can continuously aggregate and collect all the data in a central place and process it. So for us, uh, there are different patterns that we have to now come up with, like how can we move the processing closer to the actual data. But at the same time, this has to integrate with existing systems because just being able to predict the uh, failure of a jet, a jet engine is not that valuable or not valuable enough. Uh, we should be able to use that information to integrate with the airline operators, uh, uh, other operational systems like, say, workflow management, and figure out when is the best time to schedule the maintenance of an aircraft, bring it down, and have a substitute coming in, and so on. So this is just one example of one industry, one application in one industry. G has so many different other uh, applications, like in the pipeline industry, actually, we do collect data and centralize it. So the patterns that we had to come up with for our applications actually uh, tend to do a lot with the specifics of that industry and largely driven, or so significantly driven by the regulations in that industry. So for us, private clouds are probably the first use case. Uh, public clouds would be obviously uh, useful and they are going to be on the roadmap and they are on the roadmap, but I think so for our customers, the private clouds are the first things that we have to uh, focus on. But at the same time, as, as I talked about, like we are looking at integrating different systems of the customers. And so many of these systems are not just on their premises. They are actually B2B systems. So now uh, figuring out patterns to kind of uh, look at uh, providing enterprise to enterprise connectivity, the data models can be different from uh, different applications. So we are lo uh, looking at uh, big data for cases where that is relevant. And there is a significant portion of our application which is still transactional, still relational, and we have to be able to support all of that. Uh, I would say uh, roughly about 70% of our new applications are based on simplified data structures and data models, which means we are using NoSQL increasingly in those applications. About 30 to 35% are still relational, and we have to support those. We cannot ignore those types of models. 
yeah, that, that's interesting. There's some diversity there. So Catherine, I believe you're building out internally on OpenStack. And, and Dave, you've used some hosted capacity. And, and Cheetan, if, is it OK to say that you've used Amazon in, in some? Yeah, so we have OpenStack, we have Amazon, we have Azure. <laughs> But uh, largely, we are uh, fo first focusing on Amazon for the cloud so, part. So maybe a question I would ask is, how does Cloud Foundry's ability to run on almost any cloud that you want change how you think about capacity planning, data center planning, and you know having access to resources? Uh, well, you know, I, I can say that um, we, you know, it was one of the reasons that we went with Cloud Foundry. It was a driver for us. Um, we wanted to be infrastructure agnostic. And we wanted to have the ability to spin up in multiple clouds. We envision a future where there's, you know, hybrid cloud models. That's the norm, right? And uh, and we do need platform as a service to run in multiple. We have multiple clouds. The cloud is not just one thing, right? It's different network environments. And you know, to have that flexibility, that was really important for us. Yeah. Yeah, I can add to that. Uh, I can add to that. Actually, for us, uh, Cloud Foundry was simple not just because of the models it enables, but also because how easy it was for us to set up. So uh, as a data point, uh, when we started uh, installing Cloud Foundry internally for internal use, it just took like two or three days for us to get it completely set up. Our development team was already starting to use it. Uh, initially, we thought it might take a little while, for like three or four weeks, for the team to kind of get familiar with it. It was just a matter of a week or so. And the team was productive pretty much from like the second week onwards. So that was amazing for us. And to me, that's truly agile, because a lot of the time we say agile or use it as agile as just an adjective. But agile is useless unless you have the agile outcome associated yeah. with it. Yeah. And, and for us, it was much more of a, a decision to not be, not be tied to a single infrastructure or infrastructure provider. Um, we wanted the flexibility to, based on our needs, be able to move our applications or build new applications on different clouds based on what they were able to offer us, but for us to not be permanently stuck in that cloud by tying ourselves to all of the resources and the way that our system was deployed and built all locked into that specific cloud. So for us, uh, it was pretty obvious we didn't have, uh, there weren't a lot of places, especially when we started building it, where you get that flexibility uh, outside of Cloud Foundry. But I mean, one thing that you mentioned to me, Dave, is that more service providers could do a better job of fully supporting the Cloud Foundry CPI. And I know Amazon, we, it works fairly well. And you know, I would just make this as a note to service providers out there, Dave, maybe you want to talk about, not everyone supports full automation yet. Right, well, that's been one of our struggles in moving from V1 to V2 has been uh, getting service providers to support the Bosch CPI. Um, and really, we've found only a few thus far that have full CPI support. There are many that are weeks away, um, but it's been a struggle for us. We need more service providers offering that CPI support um, so that we have more options because we have quite a few environments. Uh, when you do continuous integration uh, and deployment, as Jonathan mentioned yesterday, uh, that means you have development environments, you have staging environments, you have testing environments, you have production. Um, those don't all have to sit in one single instance of Cloud Foundry. Generally, they don't. And generally, you're trying to do that um, as, uh, as efficiently as possible. And so having more choices uh, ends up being better, at least for everyone that's using Cloud Foundry in a similar way to, to we. Yeah. To we are. I think it's, it's, it's part of the dark secret of cloud is that there's not every service provider out there actually has a robust API that can withstand a Bosch deploy. And um, it, even some OpenStack environments um, not properly tuned uh, today fall over uh, when you know, Bosch is at full flight. And so that's something I just wanted to raise general awareness out there in the infrastructure service world is that a very demanding user of your API called Cloud Foundry is coming, and you should be ready for it. Yeah, you know, um, so we want like APIs at every layer because you know that's really where the value comes in terms of really being able to highly automate. And the whole area around service orchestration is probably, you know, I, I hope that everyone in here is really thinking about service orchestration, creating an automated catalog so that we can automate how we get to your services. Yeah. So maybe one other one other topic I wanted to get on, hit hit on quickly is is programming models and uh, runtime support. So you know, Cloud Foundry in one sense can allow you to do almost anything you want, but at the same time, when you're trying to build a software factory internally for an internal cloud, you might not want to support every everything under the sun. Do you guys want to speak a little bit about the how you enable uh, a polyglot access, or if you're more opinionated? 
At least from our perspective, we are we're more opinionated. We give uh, we give it, at different levels uh, our developers uh, a few choices, but not every choice they can possibly think of. And and what drives that is more of we decide collectively does it make sense to add a new language that that we're going to provide as a as a platform to all of the uh, development teams. So we have uh, we have Java and Python, and we also have Rails and uh, and Node.js, and uh, and those were decisions that we made based on a justification of well, we need this language to do this. The the magic comes in maintainability. You have to be able to have several people on your team or teams that can look at or understand or figure out uh, what the code's doing, and in some cases, there are time constraints to that because you have a bug to fix or you have something you need to maintain or you have a feature to add. So if you have one guy that's your Python guy and he leaves, uh, if, you're, uh, if your team's not that large, somebody on the team has to be able to go and unravel or understand it pretty quickly if you're gonna address, uh, address that problem. Um, sometimes people don't think about that and you end up, you end up and we almost did uh, the Wild West, where you, everyone wanted to write in something different, and you just can't maintain <coughs> 17 languages if you have you know, a, a smaller team trying to uh, to manage all of these different parts and pieces. Yeah, well, I, I can say for us that we are definitely struggling with that um, because if our development teams can pick what they want, and you know they're looking for agility and uh, you know trying to respond to new business models and trying to move as quickly as they can. So for us, it has really been a struggle to, can we standardize and, and what should we be enforcing there? It's a big discussion right now for us. Um, right now, I, I guess, you know, one thing, we love the build packs, right? Because, you know, this really gives us a whole other, um, you know, tool in the tool belt to try to be able to respond to the needs that we have right now. But, you know, we have this whole other program going on. We're calling it end-to-end -end developer experience because we think that um, the custom applications are the things that are going to be more differentiating for the business. And so they're going to, you know, we would like to see more of kind of the standardized things push to more of a SaaS solution and us spending more things on the custom part of it. And um, as we look at that end-to-end -end developer experience and how we pull all of this guidance together, you know, um, Angel mentioned mobile apps. That's a huge focus for us as well. Um, and then, you know, drivers around um, ser having services, web services. Uh, integrating security into your app. These are things that we're talking about and we're trying to make it easier. We're hitting our developers with all of this guidance from all these different angles. And how do we tie that all together and make it more standardized and easy for them to consume all of that guidance? So, you know, it is, you know, but I can tell you right now, we're, we're struggling with that. Are, are you building um, APIs that support, say, mobile in addition to just like offering a, a generic PaaS layer, which is a great start? Maybe it would be good to hear from folks how, how API augmentation and proprietary internal business APIs go along with the platform. I think that's, that's something we'll see a lot of. Maybe yeah. cheating. So that's something that uh, we are doing, actually. Uh, we started uh, looking at all the existing applications across G and uh, also some of the newer ones that were needed for the business models that we want to support. And uh, I, I think over a period of time, we realized that it's futile to kind of try to fix every app that's legacy. Uh, but at the same time, it's also important for us to standardize on something, at least for the future apps. So we, in fact, started building our own platform. And our own platform, not in the same sense that we are not building our own Tomcat, but uh, we are actually building something much higher level, which we are building something called Predix, which is a platform for building predictive uh, asset optimization applications. So the APIs that James was referring to for us, essentially uh, uh, referring to certain types of patterns that we see all across different industries. How can we take different assets? And in this sense, when I say assets, it's things like jet engines or turbines and stuff like that. How can we take this, uh, these assets and optimize them further? How can we integrate them with each other? How can we look at them in a combined way? Because you don't, we cannot look at these just a turbine in isolation. You have to look at its relationships with all the other assets in the ecosystem, especially for large customers. And uh, building APIs that allow us to generate uh, data uh, analyze that data, produce results, or produce reports, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, make it agile in the, from an end-to-end -end perspective, like for how to get from development all the way to production in at the shortest possible uh, time, as well as the least amount of effort. So for us, uh, actually, uh, there are two things that we want to be very uh, careful about. One is we want to make sure that the APIs that we are building are uh, not 
reinventing the wheel in that sense. So uh, leveraging existing uh, best of the breed technologies like the spring framework from Pivotal and uh, even from the application server spaces, we are actually looking at two or three options, no more than that. Uh, some of the things on the UI side, we are also standardizing our libraries as well as the development frameworks like AngularJS, the Play framework is something that we use as a standard toolkit. Uh, there are certain businesses, especially businesses like healthcare who have been traditionally more focused on .NET technologies, that's not going to go away. So there is uh, an awareness in our uh, organization that we need to support a uh, heterogeneous environment where we do have cases where special needs are addressed and not just uh, the people are not left on their own. Got it, got it. So it's great to hear you guys have all started with Cloud Foundry, you've got it, you've got it going. What are some things the community could do better? What are things that we could do better architecturally? What should be keeping us up at night to, to, sat to satisfy your, your needs? So for us, actually, uh, we do desire the, uh, the ability for Cloud Foundry to look across different kinds of operating environments. And one of the first things that we came across was uh, for especially Windows type of applications, it's uh, lacking uh, today. Uh, and there is a reason for why it is important for us, because believe it or not, G has its own database. It's called uh, Historian. It's a time series database. It's a pretty successful product on its own. And that runs only on Windows. So now if you want to sell that to a customer, and customers do have a need for that, in that case, we uh, do uh, need the support for, uh, for Windows. I mean, especially uh, environments where some of our application stacks are on Java, but certain things are running on Windows, which means we have to be able to orchestrate a complex set of things from a network, from compute, as well as from an operating system perspective, where everything is not just uh, one particular type of a thing. So that's one important thing for us. Second thing is uh, uh, being able to support different kinds of underlying stacks. So obviously OpenStack, uh, infrastructure as a service stacks I'm talking about. Uh, OpenStack is already supported, but Azure is something that is also very commonly used, especially in the healthcare business. So if uh, uh, that can be supported, it'll be great. And I understand that it's actually going to be a collaboration between the IAS providers as well as yeah, Cloud Foundry. I, I actually, I was yeah. on the phone with uh, Patrick Chanazon, who used to work on Cloud Foundry, who's now at Azure. And I, I asked Microsoft very nicely to participate in the open source community and to help support our IaaS uh, CPI layer. So does anyone have any great connections with Microsoft where we can kick off? <laughs> <laughs> Chris? This is serious. I mean, I, I take it very seriously of trying to get people involved. So um, it, it's, uh, this is actually a pretty good cue. Jared, you're, you're going to give a talk. Um, Jared from Tier 3 is going to give a talk of the, you know, what he's doing over the next six months to make uh, Cloud Foundry and Windows first class, um, to make the support first class. It's been there for a while with Iron Foundry, but we're going to be incorporating it more and more into the main line. So I think you'll get some help there. This is uh, Jawad from Uhuru, which is the other .NET company. So we want to make sure that all ISs are provided, but I think we need uh, Pivotal to get on with the program also. Okay. There's a little tension in our .NET community, so. <laughs> 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 There's been two providers, and I think the important thing is we're going to get it all into the open source main line, and we can all work it on as a community from there. I'm looking forward to that, so. This is why we ask these questions on stage, right? On, on the record. Uh, Catherine, any, any feedback? Oh, well, I, one of my uh, biggest issues right now is end-to-end -end, um, uh, identity for, um, you know, we, we have this big program called Five Star Apps, and, you know, our CIO talks about this very publicly. And basically, we're trying to take all of our enterprise applications and make sure that they run across a whole variety of browsers, across operating systems, and across devices. And, um, and the, the security challenge that that presents is, is really interesting because um, a lot of those devices are BYO, so they're not even enterprise devices. And to be able to federate with enterprise identity and really make it work end to end, and, be, and a lot of these applications, and by the way, I want all of these applications to land on top of PaaS, right? Um, but uh, the, the back end is going to be systems that are existing and they're going to be landed uh, in the internal environment and so we want to expose that through um, a services gateway and make that consumable by the apps that are on PaaS, which will land on a network segment that sits outside of Intel, um, either on the DMZ or even um, uh, you know, what we call our exclave environment. And so when you think about the security challenge of end-to-end -end through all of those devices and being able to authenticate, that's um, a big challenge for us right now. 
I, so I think generally it's more of uh, now that Cloud Foundry's moving closer and closer to being something that not only um, uh, providers would, would want to run, but more of something that enterprises uh, really want to run. There are a lot of enterprisey features that could go into uh, to what Cloud Foundry is. So I think moving more of an eye to a focus on what uh, what enterprises need, which there's a very long list of, of wants and needs and nice to haves for for the enterprise. That could be anything from uh, from something like identity, like you were mentioning. There's auditing. There's uh, integration with other systems, there's logging, there's migration capability. There, the list is pretty big uh, uh, of what an enterprise needs to be able to uh, to really drop Cloud Foundry in and, and take full advantage of it. Got it, got it. All right, well, hey, this was really interesting conversation, and I, I didn't want to go too, too deep or have you real, reveal too many architectural secrets of what you guys are up to, but I just wanted to give people a little bit of a flavor of what's it like to build a PaaS internally and to get businesses using it. So congrats on your progress so far, and hopefully we'll see you guys back in six months, get a progress update, and see what we can do. Okay, thanks awesome. for having us. Thank yeah, you. yeah, thanks. Thank you.